Hi, and welcome to Bistax Inside Trading Show. The show is all about trading, and every week we discuss what trading is all about and what are the required habits of a successful trader. We will also share trading ideas and themes, all of which are designed to help you make money. Now, with me today is my co-host, Pang Vi Lung. He's the founder and CIO of Track Record Trading Academy, as well as Nicholas Koh the partner and CIO of Dune Asset Management. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Hey, it's Brian. good to be here. Let's talk um, about uh, trading. Now let's talk about trading, but we always start be our show with a quote, and you've got one from Jesse Livermore. Okay, let's see the quote. So uh, here, he says, uh, do not anticipate and move without market confirmation. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that uh, sometimes it, it doesn't pay to rush into get into uh, themes early, right? You don't need to be fully invested before uh, the market starts to confirm your view. You can start building your position, but once you see confirmation, i.e. the price is moving in your favor, uh, then you can start adding to your position. But of course, it tend to make you a little bit late. So, but being late, in your trade is your insurance that you are right or wrong, right? So it's good to get confirmation, especially if you're looking for a very long-term themes where you believe you are targeting 100% or 200% moves, which we tend to be looking for when we are trading in the longer term, trading for, for the longer term. Now, what we normally do in this show, of course, is talk around themes to validate this these uh, quotes. Now, what's the theme you want to talk about today, uh, V? Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about nuclear. So the question we are asking is, is the world uh, going nuclear again? And of course, it's not about the, the war or the threat of nuclear war, but more about the promise of nuclear energy, right? Uh, first, we start off with what's going on in China. And recently, uh, on in August, just last month, we saw that China has uh, approved the construction of six more nuclear reactors. And it is now the fastest growing nuclear power and producer in the world. It's the second largest nuclear energy producer in the world. It has a capacity of 57 gigawatts with 55 reactors in operation. That is almost 15% of the world, uh, uh, world production. And that's and bigger than France already because France has a uh, bigger installation and has been the leader in nuclear reactors globally. Uh, well, okay, yes, but uh, not anymore because, uh, of course, as we know, the energy needs of the second biggest economy in the world will dwarf that of uh, most of the other economies as well. But, uh, of course, uh, the, there is a transition between the carbon economy to the nuclear uh, nuclear energy uh, uh, production. And uh, that's what we are seeing uh, going accelerating in China because I think uh, for China also, it's a case of... Uh, uh, energy security, right? They do not want to be always uh, the at, 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 at the mercy of other uh, energy exporters around the world. And it's much easier to have nuclear reactors and stockpile nuclear uh, fuel than uh, carbon fuel, right? Mm -hmm. So they have currently uh, 23 nuclear units under construction and uh, more is like, likely to come online going forward as well. But not just for their own domestic use, they are also looking to export their technology uh, to other countries. Uh, UK, Argentina have signed deals to cooperate with uh, China and Pakistan have already some nuclear reactors built with Chinese assistance and in operation and also under construction. Then there's the smaller countries, they have also expressed interest in China's small modular reactors, which is the cutting edge of uh, nuclear production, nuclear energy production right now. And, and this uh, is also, and I want to stop you here, V, because this is also what's fueling the surge again in construction. It's energy efficiency of these new reactors, reduced cost and reduced size and reduced investment per reactor, which is now then making it far more affordable too. As you can see, countries like smaller countries like Morocco, Turkey, Thailand, and Jordan. Yes, and it's also uh, a case of better security, uh, better safety measures than before. So it's, it's 
it's of course I think the world still remembers uh, quite clearly the Fukushima disaster and, and of Chernobyl course Chernobyl a lot if you're older yeah yeah <laughs> I wasn't there I was a uh, very young then I think <laughs> then, then in any case uh uh yeah that that's what we are seeing as well because of the improvements in the technology it's become safer it's become cheaper it's become easier to deploy and as such we are seeing even countries such as Thailand and Turkey uh, being interested in deploying this technology, right? And uh, I think that's 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 against the backdrop of very negative news that we've seen in the last few years because of Fukushima and actually recently the Japanese release of uh, the, the, the wastewater into the sea. So that's always this negative uh, connotations to nuclear energy, but that is uh, actually not so true anymore because the world has come to uh, accept that uh, not the world, but most majority of the countries that are doing this, they have come to accept that it is a necessary uh, uh, price to pay for new uh, energy security and and a uh, 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 consistent and safe source of energy for their economies. Now, Nick, there are also other different countries and technologies, even in in the in the West, the, the traditional places like the US, who are now then re-looking at nuclear energy, correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah, so to add to V's point on the um, safety of nuclear, I think there was a lot of negative press, of course, post Fukushima, um, what happened, right? But um, what is interesting about new nuclear uh, technology is that in previous technology, they had to use water to cool the reactors if there's going to be an accident in the nuclear plants. And that's what happened in Fukushima. When the nuclear coal melted down, there was no one that was able to go in to cool the reactors because the water pumps were damaged, right? Um, what has happened across the world now in nuclear reactors is that they are using um, new technology where the coal will collapse into the ground. So they are going to use earth and sand to cool the reactors. So there is no longer going to be they're no longer going to be needing uh, water pumps to cool the reactor. So that in itself makes nuclear technology a lot safer because it will just collapse into the earth, right? If there's going to, going to be an accident. And um, the other thing is that what people don't understand about nuclear is that the security around nuclear plants in terms of the amount of concrete and steel they use to build around the core is extremely thick and it can withstand missile strikes and uh, bunker buster bombs if um and one anyone were to try to strike a nuclear plant right i think that was one of the um key concerns in the ukraine russia war where um russia was using the ukrainian power plant as a as a bait right to say that they're gonna they're gonna um attack the plant and cause a nuclear fallout but what people don't under understand is that a missile strike will not damage the core because of the uh, amount of concrete that is being used to protect the um, the the nuclear cores or core right so that was what russia understood and they're just using it to bait the media that they can actually cause a nuclear fallout with a missile strike yep and in the west um yes there's a lot of other new nuclear technology that is coming out in terms of smrs and this is a space that um, we should keep a close watch of and it's even people like Bill Gates uh, uh, who's getting in on this act. Yes, that's right. Now, V, it's not just China, but it's also other the other large emerging superpower, India. That's also yes. So that's India also, also uh, India is also uh, just announced that uh, in, in at the end of June, their first domestically produced nuclear reactor came online, and. Uh, it was built by an Indian corporation and uh, they are building two two more uh, and they are looking to expand their power generation capacity uh, from around 7 gigawatts to uh, to 22.4, right? Uh, so that, that's more than triple what their current, current production is. So not just China, as you said, India is also doing so. And we are also seeing uh, Europe, which is there's a, there's a big divide in Europe Germany is quite anti-nuclear. They are they are decommissioning. They are closing their nuclear power plants, which was built years ago and nearing the end of their life. But the rest of Europe, though, is becoming more reliant on nuclear energy because, as we know, the nuclear, uh, not the nuclear, the, the Ukraine war has uh, uh, cut off a natural 
natural gas supply to Europe at various junctures. And then uh, it's still there's an embargo going on on Russian energy sources. But uh, the U European nuclear reactors, which were built in the 1970s and 80s, are coming to the end of their uh, predicted life lifespan, so they are built to last only thirty years or thirty or so years. Ninety percent have passed or are nearing the end of their lifestyle uh, lifespan. But we are seeing now more and more plans uh, looking to extend these existing uh, nuclear plants. So, for example, from this chart, if you see the chart on your screen, uh, the grayed out boxes are for the nuclear plants that are looking. Uh, I have a recent a proof. Uh, receive extension approvals, right? So as you mentioned, France, which has uh, 56 nuclear reactors, uh, 41 uh, have already received extension approvals. And that is the case going forward as well. And uh, we are likely to see more and more come online, not just new builds, but extension of old nuclear power plants, right? And recently also, on another note, there is the, just announced a few days ago, there's a net zero nuclear initiative, uh, which is essentially means that there's uh, no carbon, uh, no net zero carbon emissions without nuclear. So nuclear is going to play a big part according to this initiative of uh, producing the world's energy needs. And they're looking to triple the capacity by 2050 to achieve that uh, net zero climate goal. And uh, that, that would imply that global deployment will need to uh, increase to 40 uh, a year. And then that is actually six times the deployment rate we have seen over the past decade. And we are seeing an acceleration on this front from China and from India and from other various countries you mentioned as well. So why, why are we going to uh, nuclear energy? So as, as Nick says, it's a lot safer than uh, most people believe. Because I think we, we we in our memories are the 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 horror stories of Chernobyl uh, and Fukushima. But more importantly, though, it is not just about uh security of energy, but it's also uh keeping energy costs low. Because we have seen that the spikes in energy prices because of all this geopolitical instability has caused hardships for the general population. Right, it's been a uh, quite impactful on inflation and on the economies. And there is a changing perceptions to nuclear energy as we start to see more people such as Nick, who is much younger, such growing up in an environment where they have much more information about what the nuclear production is actually uh, all about. And in general, actually, in, actually, in, it's almost impossible without new technology for us to meet the carbon goals. Right, uh, that is stated by all the countries that they want to move towards a carbon neutral kind of economy. But if you imagine it, for three tons of carbon emitted for the energy produced by nuclear, uh, the equivalent using fossil fuels will be 490, 490 tons. That's a lot, right? Well, so also, you can... we, it's an emissions thing at the end of the day, not just the physical uh, uh, amount of input. But it's an emissions thing as well. Just imagine replacing Nick and the one coal-powered plant, coal-fired large plant with a small modular nuclear plant. All right. Yes. It's a completely caught from a cost equation, from a factor input, from an emissions. It's a huge game changer for that particular economy. Yeah, yeah, exactly true. So is, as, as you said, efficiency is that one small pallet of nuclear fuel, which is one to two centimeters, is equivalent to half a cubic meter of fossil fuels, right? It's it's the efficiency of production, is the, the safety, cheap, as well as the consistency. And the stability of the energy source is, uh, is, is very important because renewable energy and renewable sources of energy such as windmills and solar panels, they are very dependent on uh, conditions, environmental conditions. So if it's snowing too hard, the windmills may freeze over, so solar panels may be covered. So we, we have that consistency and stability that nuclear energy provides. I think one of the key things, uh, uh, and, and I hear, like to hear your thoughts, Nick, as well are on this, is really from a energy grid perspective, having a mix of options is probably what a lot of governments are going for. They, they're trying to reduce their risk 
obviously geopolitical risk around uh, 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 getting fossil fuels from specific suppliers. China, of course, being a classic example, because they are so heavily dependent on imports. And a, a country like Japan, for example, same issue as well. Um, your thoughts on this, Nick? Yeah, so I think um, that's a very good question, right, about energy grid, because in my nature of business for, let's say, Bitcoin mining, I need to understand energy grid quite well. And um, actually, the only country in the world that is actually doing this right is China, right? China understands the, um, the concept of baseload power, right? Baseload power means energy that is constant, right? You can't build a civilization on top of transient power, right? Transient power are things like uh, wind power and solar power, right? If the wind stops blowing and the sun, sun stops shining, then you can't run your economy, right? Um, what China has done right is they are not very big on wind and solar, but they have been keeping their coal plants on, their coal um, um, plants running. But at the same time, they're building a, a lot of um, nuclear plants. In that way, they are able to transition their economy without any hiccups um, towards another stable baseload power that is clean. And the other, on the flip side, if you look at Germany, which is screwing up big time in their um, energy transition, where power prices have been spiking. If you recall, I think in 2022, 2021, there was a huge energy crisis in Germany. Um, because of a bad snowstorm which covered the solar panels and their windmill was frozen, there was a surge in power prices, right? And there was um there was a lot of issues in in, in which 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 um occurred in uh, German society, right? Because households are finding it hard to pay for energy bills because of that, and I think um that is a classic example of how not to um approach this energy policy right? and i think what countries have been coming to around is that nuclear they realize is the only way to achieve um net zero carbon emissions while um maintaining stable power sources um to their economies right? and that's why we are seeing a lot of um turnaround in terms of um um people's perception of nuclear um France has turned around on, on it, right? Japan is starting to turn around on it and realizing that um, transient power like wind and solar is not going to be the answer to achieving net zero carbon emissions. And also, as you said, the stability issue is a big issue. But can I ask you this? This seems fascinating because we suddenly have such an increase in demand. See, one of the key things that has happened, and, and we, based on your presentation, not only are there new nuclear reactors coming on stream, the old ones which were supposed to be decommissioned, particularly in, in, in what stands out is France, are being given life extensions, which means then there's, there is going to be additional demand for uranium. Now, perhaps, gentlemen, you can share with us then how does that impact the supply side of the equation and can we ramp up supply easily? Right. So I think that is going to have a huge impact on supply, right? Um, and what's exciting about uranium is I think it's, a, it's an investment where there is a lot of asymmetry waiting to happen. Um, Uranium is unlike any other commodity where you can just flip a switch and maybe in two to three years, you can start getting the commodity out of the ground, right? And, and an example of that is lithium mines. It's easy. Copper, tin. Um, even in the, U in the US shale oil, it's very easily recoverable. Within one to two years, you can get it out of the ground. For uranium, uh, number one, because obviously it can be enriched and used for harm. Um, it's a very regulated commodity. So in essence, it takes about 10 to 15 years to start a new uranium mine. And that is wow. the lag time. 10 to 15 years is a at. very long lag time. <laughs> yes, it is. And that is why we are saying that this is going to be a super cycle because supply can definitely not come online fast enough to meet demand. And the, and the amazing thing about uranium uh, nuclear power plants is that demand is inelastic, right? They are not going to stop buying uranium just because prices quadruple or more, more than that and more than quadruple right because uh, the demand is inelastic you don't spend billions of dollars building a nuclear plant and saying i'm not going to buy feed stock because the uh, commodity it's um has gone up a lot and even if the commodity price has gone up a lot it's not going to really affect end users because um uranium production energy production for uranium is so efficient 
that it will not actually move the end users um, price that much, even if the feedstock price goes up a lot. And that is one okay. of the biggest asymmetry that... Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, just finish what you want to say and I have a question for you. Yes, and, and another interest, interesting thing is um, the geopolitical risk. Um, Kazakhstan is the world's largest uh, exporter of uranium, right? Just like in oil, um, Saudi Arabia it is the largest, it's a, it's a swing producer, and right? Kazakhstan is a swing producer. So Kazakhstan is within the sphere. It's, it's caught in between um, the West, and of course, it is under the Russian and Chinese cloud uh, influence, right? Um. Western, I believe Western um, reactors or Western nuclear uh, companies is going to have a very hard time contracting Kazakh uranium uh, because of uh, the geopolitical tension between the, um, Russia, China, and the West. And that is more supply that I think may be taken off the market if, let's say, um, Russia and China will want to weaponize um, the commodity, right? And the only other there's only two other continents in the world that produce uranium, but not at the scale of Kazakhstan, and that is Canada and um, Africa, which we are seeing um, uprisings in, in, in Niger and, um, and, um, and other parts of the Sahel region, right? So I think that is even more asymmetry on top of, on top of what we're talking about in terms of um, um, extremely short supply already. So that's going to be, I mean, that's fascinating. So let me ask you this. I'm an existing supplier. I'm, fr I'm an ex existing consumer. I'm France. I have so many reactors. I, I see this coming. I see China adding capacity. I see India adding capacity. Can I then stockpile uranium today for my needs? Yes, you can stockpile uranium today. Um, actually, that's what's happening. That's why we are seeing spot uranium prices start, start to inch up. Uh, um, the Western world usually contract from Canada, which the largest company is called Chemical. Um, and what and what Chemical said last week in their earnings call was interesting that their long term contracting is so booked out that they don't even have enough uranium to supply to these um uh uh, uh reactors right, and they need to uh, join the public market in buying spot uranium in the open market to fulfill their contract obligations. And this is just the start of the contracting cycle, right? And I think um, once all these um, uh, reactors start to come online, I think that's where we're going to see a massive re-rating in the uh, underlying uh, uh, feedstock price of, 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 of uranium. Wow, this is interesting. So how do we make money on this? How do we, what's the trading opportunities around this for an investor? Right, so I think V has a chart on the, on, on, on the next slide. Um, so the easiest way actually is to buy um, or to gain exposure to the direct underlying, which is um, physical uranium. The uh, chemical uh, ticker, I mean the chemical uh, uh, compound is called U308, right? That is the, um, that is the uh, compound that, that, that we want to gain exposure to. Um, so the uh, the easiest way to gain exposure is through the Sprott Uranium Trust. They are set up in Canada. They are Canadian trust, which whose sole purpose is just to buy physical uranium, right? So um, as physical uranium prices go up, the, the price of the underlying trust goes up in value as well. And this is the cleanest way to play um, the this uranium super cycle. Yeah, so as you can see, if the chart is on the screen, you can see that uh, it is now at the highest level for the past two years. And of course, uh, if you look at this, then you think it's it's a bit expensive, it's pricey. But as we said earlier, using uh, when we talk about the trading tip, uh, is that this is actually price confirmation. And if you look on the longer term chart, uh, it has a long way to go, right? Uh, as, as we have uh, also discussed, the supply situation is uh is not so easy to solve, but the demand side of the equation is getting uh very clear that there's more and more demand coming online. The ex 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 uh the the lifespan of uh, reactors that were expected to be mothball is now uh being extended. So there's going to be double whammy of uh old supply, old demand continuing to to be there, and then new demand continuing to come online. And then as Nick says, it takes 10 to 15 years. And it's very difficult to for, for 
because all these producers have been hurt by previous cycles before, it takes some time before they, they decide to commit the capital to 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 start a, a new mine without clear confirmation of prices going up and a very, very clear uh, directive from the markets that this high prices will last for a very long time to come. So I think uh, the easiest way, as Nick said, is to just buy the spot the Sprott Uranium Trust, which is an ETF that just buys the uranium. But also, there's going to be other benef ben uh, ben beneficiaries of this uh, uh, cycle, because ura uranium miners and all, but we can discuss that in other episodes ahead as we get more confirmation from the market that this theme, which we have been believing in for some years now, uh, is going to be continuing to grow at, in uh, in strength of momentum. Gentlemen, thank you very much for taking your time to be on this fascinating show revolving around uranium. Thanks, Brian. Right, thank you, Brian. Here. Speak again soon. Take care. Uh, I'm Brian Fernandez, and with me has been Pang V. Lung, uh, CEO of Track Record Academy, and Nick Ko, partner and CIO of Dune Asset Management. This has been the Inside Trading Show. This show will be on our website, www.biztech.asia, as well as our syndication partners, TV stations, radio stations, and websites. Thanks a lot for tuning in. 